la brecha de inversión de infraestructura y la maximización del financiamiento para el desarrollo. Este va a ser el tema de esta, este panel, esta segunda parte, en esta conferencia que repetimos. Eh, ustedes pueden también seguir vía streaming con el hashtag Crecer2019. Les contamos que este panel va a ser moderado por Merlin Margaret Barudi. Ella es a quien les pedimos que vaya pasando por acá. Ella es la directora de Economía y Sostenibilidad de la Agencia Multilateral de Garantía de Inversiones MIGA del Grupo del Banco Mundial. Y también va a contar con la participación, si van por favor pasando aquí, de eh, panelistas de Elena Yanchovichina, economista principal adjunta del Banco Mundial para América Latina y el Caribe. También va a estar Richard Cabello, gerente para la unidad de asesoría en transacciones APP de la Corporación Financiera Internacional para América Latina y el Caribe. Fidel Jaramillo, representante del BID y BID Invest para Costa Rica. Una brecha amplia de financiamiento impide que nuestra región y el Caribe pues, alcance los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Se hace necesario incluir más capital privado para poder maximizar todo lo que es el financiamiento para el desarrollo. Así que esta plenaria se va a enfocar específicamente en las necesidades del sector privado para aumentar la inversión en desarrollo. Nuestra moderadora, la señora Merly Margaret, dirige la División de Seguro de Riesgo Político y Mejora de Crédito del Grupo Mundial y se unió a Amiga en el 2016. Previ previamente trabajó en el Banco Mundial como directora y, ofic y oficial principal de crédito. Eh, también antes del Banco Mundial, estaba, trabajó para la unidad de inteligencia de Economist Group JP Morgan Chase Company. La señora Elena Yanchovichina es economista principal adjunta del Banco Mundial para América Latina y el Caribe. Aquí está, bienvenida. Fue anteriormente economista, líder del Banco Mundial para el of the World Bank for the Middle East. En África, un senior economist in the Department of Economic Policy and Debt. Richard Cabello is the manager. Welcome for the unit of PPP Transactions Consultancy Unity of the International Financial Corporation, IFC, for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Miguel Jaramillo, representative of IDB in Costa Rica since 2018, joined the institution in 2005, an economic regional consultant for the Andean countries, and then he was a representative in Peru. So I give the floor over to our moderator, Ms. Marilyn Marguerite Barudi. Thank you very much uh, for the pleasure of being here. Um, I will be speaking in English. Uh, I actually uh, did my undergraduate and graduate studies in, in uh, Latin American studies and actually spent quite a bit of time here in Costa Rica, but it was a long time ago. And paths have um, meant that when I try and speak Spanish now, a number of other languages come out. So uh, to spare you that, I will uh, stick with the, the English. Uh, and I hope uh, you understand, and my apologies for that. Um, as you will have heard, this is about uh, the infrastructure uh, situation and the, uh, as well as uh, the private sector role in trying to solve the infrastructure gap. Uh, as, of course, I'm sure all of you know, there's a huge infrastructure financing gap uh, across the globe, uh, as well as one in the Latin American region. And in Latin America in particular, that gap has meant that many of the objectives and aspirations of the governments and the people of Latin America have not been fulfilled as a result. And I think one of the conclusions we heard in some of the other sessions so far, and certainly a conclusion that we at the World Bank Group have reached, is that government financing and multilateral financing on their own cannot solve this infrastructure gap, and that we need to rely on private sector financing to ensure that the gap is made smaller. So this session 
we'll focus on specific needs that the private sector is looking for in order to find a more welcoming home to, to participate in the development of countries in the region. So we'll be touching on the issues around corporate governance, around the robustness of legal frameworks, around adequate risk return trade-offs and the allocation of risks in project finance, in terms of also uh, issues around greater financial disclosure, around robust regulatory frameworks, around predictability, and also around de-risking issues. So uh, we will have, of, as you've already heard, quite a distinguished group joining us on these various issues. And I would turn to my distinguished colleague, Elena, to set us off. She will be uh, setting the stage for the macro issues within the region in terms of the trends for the region and, and how they impact on the infrastructure gaps that the region is facing. So with that, I will turn to my colleague, Elena. Thank you very much, Morley. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to share with you a few thoughts on the economic outlook in the region and uh, on uh, the investment prospects or trends, uh, both uh, uh, past trends, but also some thoughts on going, going forward and uh, motivate a little bit with empirical evidence the need for uh, uh, getting pro more private investment uh, into infrastructure product projects in the region and the policies that uh, will help to do that. Uh, so, turning to the not so um, uh, recent, uh, the, the recent past, we noticed that uh, there have been a few years of declining growth in the region, but uh, the economies of Latin America and the Caribbean turned a corner in 2017, and there was a recovery which initially was thought to be stronger, but it turned out to be relatively weak and bumpy. Uh, three of the largest economies in the region, Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil, uh, had either negative growth or very weak growth, and there has been an implosion in economic activity in Venezuela. Overall, uh, the World Bank's most recent semi-annual report on the outlook projects that uh, growth in the region will average slightly less than 1% in 2019, which is not really an improvement over growth uh, outcomes in um, 2018. It's also important to mention some uh, headwinds, possibilities that uh, things will actually turn to be more difficult for uh, the economies in the region, and they come from the external environment. Uh, first of all, there is uh, a possibility that the slowdown in China uh, and also the weakness in commodity prices will harm the uh, commodity exporters in the region and we have a variety of countries that depend on agricultural commodities but also metals and uh, oil exports. On the bright side of things we've seen that growth in the US has been relatively robust and uh, in uh, recent months, uh, there has been also some clarity that the Federal Reserve will pause uh, increases in interest rates, uh, at least until the end of this year, which will be a breather for uh, the economies in the region uh, because it will relieve pressures on local currencies and also pressures on capital outflows from some of the countries uh, that we've seen are occurring in the past year. Well, given that, uh, we, uh, however, need to notice that the, uh, there is a, a difference between the outlook for South America versus Central uh, America and the Caribbean, and this is because of these uh, recessions and crisis in separate countries in South America. What we project is a growth of less than half a percent for South America and a growth above 3% for the uh, Caribbean countries and Central American countries. Having looked at this outlook, we want to emphasize that there is a great degree of uncertainty. Um, this outlook is subject to a number of risks, and these are not only the ones that I just mentioned in terms of headwinds from coming from US or weakness in China, uh, but also the intensification of 
uh, the trade war between US and China and the effects that this uh, intensification may have on China's growth, US growth, and then, of course, the growth of the global economy. And there is also uncertainty as to how this is going to affect the countries in uh, the region. In addition to that, of course, it is uh, also important to mention uh, domestic risks, and they come from geopolitical uh, pressures in different parts of the region, like Venezuela, Nicaragua. There are, um, as mentioned in the previous panel, um, migration movement, uh, and also refugees streaming into different countries, straining budgets of uh, host uh, economies. Uh, and, of course, there, this is a year where a number of countries will have elections, so there is polarization of electorates, the, and, and it isn't clear how these elections are going to uh, turn out, uh, bringing some uncertainty there. And uh, so, overall, there is a great degree also of uncertainty about the economic outlook in the Caribbean and Central America in particular, given the disaster risk which has intensified due to climate uh, uh, change, and uh, this is worth mentioning. In terms of uh, the, in, in order to compare the outcome, uh, outcomes in Latin America, uh, we need to look not only uh, to the past and the future for the region itself, but to compare it to other regions, and we see that this recovery has been weak, even compared to some of the regions that are facing real issues, and these are the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So even when we compare Latin America's growth prospects with these two regions, we see that the Latin American region is not going to grow very fast. Um, and certainly it is growing at a much lower rate than the natural comparators, which are the emerging markets in East, East Asia, South Asia, but also Europe. And this is not a new phenomenon. If you look at the growth outcomes of the region going half a century uh, earlier, uh, we see that uh, growth has been actually quite uh, weak compared to the middle income regions and also compared to OECD countries. With uh, growth, if we start comparing growth outcomes since the 80s, the deceleration that we observe everywhere is actually more pronounced in Latin America and the Caribbean. So one reason for the weak growth is uh, the low investment rate, and this is where I'm going to focus in the second half of this presentation, even though we already know that there is also very weak productivity growth. But the two are linked in a way, and so if you look at the growth rates of uh, investment, the investment rate in the region, we've noticed that it's actually very low compared to what investment rates uh, are observed in other regions. And this is both because private investment is not very high, uh, although it is higher than in some of the other regions like the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but what really strikes one is the extremely low uh, public investment rate. Uh, and it has been low for uh, the past three decades. Uh, this uh, has been associated in particular with relatively limited fiscal space. Um, many of our countries have faced a variety of crises in the past 40 years. And even looking, this is uh, data from our recent report on the region, we noticed that 27 out of the 32 countries are expected to have fiscal deficits, which will translate into higher debt levels. And we noticed that for some of the large economies like Brazil and Argentina, the debt levels are higher than the average for the region. So all of this suggests that there would be a need for fiscal adjustment. Uh, there has been already some of this translating into uh, pressure on, on interest rates. Uh, in a sense, uh, the developments of uh, the past two years have translated into higher, into downgrades and higher interest rates on foreign borrowing, uh, which implies that future uh, lending or foreign borrowing would be coming at a higher cost. 
and this fiscal adjustment from what we observe in uh, research uh, suggests that whenever there is a spending, um, spending adjustment falls mostly on uh, public investment cuts. Uh, this has been the case before 2007, where 66% of spending cuts have come from cuts in uh, public investment and therefore infrastructure projects. Uh, and this has been even more so after 2007 when inflation in many of these countries declined. So when inflation is low, most of the adjustment, uh, actually there is a need for greater adjustment and it falls mostly on public investment too. Um, and one final thought is that, uh, uh, or, or piece of evidence that comes uh, quite strikingly for the region is the fact that um, many of the Latin American countries uh, fall in the group of countries with relatively weak rule of law. Uh, these are countries that are uh, part of uh, the group that falls below the median for the world, according to uh, governance rankings. And we see that in countries that have relatively weak rule of law, public investments uh, have relatively, uh, they basically have no effect on average on growth in the next period. Whereas in countries with good rule of law, there is a positive association between investment in this period and uh, growth in the next period. So this suggests that um, going forward, it would be crucial to lift create conditions that improve um, in the environment for private investment in infrastructure, something that my colleagues discussed in the previous session, but now we see the empirical evidence for it. Public investment is low, extremely low actually, because of limited fiscal space, and there is a need to improve a number of areas in order to cre create conducive conditions for both public and private investment to have positive effects on growth and job creation. These are in two main areas. In a world of lower liquidity, it will be very important for countries to strengthen their fiscal, monetary, and financial frameworks, uh, come up with new sources of revenue, and also increase the efficiency of public spending. Another area, and this is the area of structural reforms to create conditions for uh, private investors to come in and find uh, more opportunities for profitable projects, involves structural reforms in the area of education, in particular improving the quality of education and therefore the quality of human capital, improving competition, which will open up space for more projects, uh, improving regional integration, which will enlarge markets and create conditions for the type of projects that we discussed in uh, uh, the previous sessions. Uh, and the enormous importance of improving governance, in particular transparency and accountability. And I think I'm gonna finish here and turn to my colleagues to fill in on this area. Okay, thank you very much, Elena, for that uh, whirlwind tour of the region. Uh, with a, a strong focus on um, uh, some things that uh, can be done to enhance uh, the performance going forward. So at this point then, I would uh, turn to Fidel, who will deepen and add to the discussion at this point and talk about the private investment in the region in terms of the sectoral focus as well as a, a greater focus in terms of infrastructure and, and where that is and headed. So Fidel, may I turn to you? Thank you. So those moments that are also the big challenges we'll have here, the presenters. Two minutes and 45 seconds is the time, uh, average uh, attention span of those who participate in these events give to panel members like us. And 165 times is the average amount of times 
we lift our iPhones to see messages or to answer messages. So with these challenges before us, to try to extend your attention span to this presentation and thus prevent adding to 165 times you see your iPhones. And for that reason, I'm going to stand. And although these are challenges for Latin America, challenges are much related to these two numbers because we're talking about the digital agenda. We're talking about transformations uh, that are uh, undergoing a, the, well, undergone by the planet because of the fourth uh, revolution. But Latin America has other challenges, not only the challenges of the 21st century, and some that for President Alvaro related to the uh, 2019 agenda, for instance, with uh, trains, with the a 20th century agenda, for instance, roads, water, and sanitation. I believe that the big challenge will be for Latin America to uh, approach all these challenges of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century and do this simultaneously without wasting time. And one of these, without a doubt, is related to the quality of infrastructure. According to the World Economic Forum, Latin America has a quality of infrastructure only above uh, Sub-Sahara, Africa, and some of the poorest countries of South Asia. We're very much uh, below North American countries, European countries, and in general, the Southeast Asian countries. Costa Rica is in the average of Latin America. And this has grave implications, which have been shown previously by literature. Latin America in the last 25 years has invested close to 2.5, 2.7% in infrastructure. And we're talking about a public infrastructure as well as private. And there's an agreement among the economists that to close this gap, we must invest close to 5% per year of our GDP. Investment has been an average low, but public investment is reaching excessively low levels. My colleagues from the research department of IDB published the macroeconomic report for this year, and one of its most important chapters is related to infrastructure investment. And they concluded something I think is surprising. If Latin America does not cover that infrastructure gap and doesn't allocate resources to do so in the next decade. In average, we would be losing 15% of the gross domestic product in the region. This is a huge number. In Costa Rica, we're talking about something similar to 15% in this next decade. And this makes highly important to put all our efforts in increasing those resources and as we'll see also in the quality and efficiency of infrastructure investment. But this is complicated because Elena, as she said, this is will bring us to a turning point, but unfortunate for the region. In this graph we see in the horizontal axis the indebtedness level and we have countries that are extremely indebted like Brazil, Jamaica, Barbados. Uh, and Brazil, and a small number of countries to the left of this graph have low levels of indebtedness, and the middle, those of uh, average indebtedness, like in the case of Costa Rica. But in the vertical axis, we calculated the need for a fiscal adjustment required by the countries to stabilize their public finances. So it's a uh, a uh, point where we have to make the fiscal adjustment to reestablish macroeconomic conditions, but we are in very high levels of indebtedness. And in these circumstances, we ask ourselves, how can we fund all these investments we must carry out in infrastructure? But the fiscal topic and the macro topic is not the only ones. There are other aspects that require attention. The first one is related to the quality of products and this uh, takes me to the important role of planning governments have for several decades 
uh, the offices or the planning ministries were decentralized, but they weren't replaced by a new version of these. And this uh, caused that responsibility that was uh, in pre-investment and of having better projects to decrease in quality and in many times completely absent. When there is a bankable project, a mature project, it usually finds funding. But we have had scarce investment in those studies and that pre-investment, which is highly necessary. In all cases, the availability of funding is a restriction. And this uh, goes alongside with the attraction of private investment and uh, specifically uh, viable projects, institutional framework, and risk management. So in these circumstances, with fiscal weaknesses at, in macro level and weaknesses in micro level of the quality of projects, what can we do? Well, first of all, we must learn from the past. This was also mentioned by Elena. This is the effect of a fiscal consolidation in the growth of public investment. And in the past, Latin America, when it made fiscal adjustments, the first victim was public investment. And this definitely was a bad bet for the region. Luckily, we have mechanisms to protect that public investment, which are the fiscal rules. And there are fiscal rules that are inflexible. Uh, in other words, without protecting any uh, investment uh, expenditure and others that are more flexible that protect public investment. Advantageously, Costa Rica just passed a fiscal rule that protects public investment, which only requires adjustments when the level of indebtedness of the central government exceeds 60% of GDP. So we're reaching those levels, but at least it protects public investment. And there's a simulation here of my colleagues where you can clearly see that an inflexible rule causes a drop in public investment while a flexible rule that protects public investment from the capitals market, from other multilaterals and from other players who are core in funding public investment. I think this was discussed widely in previous panel, was training the environment for PPPs. Recently, the bank published the Infrascope which evaluates the environment to perform business in public-private partnerships. It measures five important factors that go from regulations, institutions, maturity, investment climate, and funding. The good news for Costa Rica is that it increased from the 10th to the 5th position, tying with Brazil and very close to countries like Chile, Peru, Colombia, which have a very important background in concessions. And this is really a paradox, I thought, because we've gone from the 10th to the 5th position, but in the last five years, we have had no new concessions, nor any new PPPs. It's a favorable and positive story before this reality is that Costa Rica has everything to really launch in public-private partnerships. It has a regulatory framework better than Latin America, better institutions, maturity, and it has two big weaknesses. The main one is the uh, investment uh, environment and access to funding. And I think that in these two factors where Costa Rica is poorly ranked, there's a role for multilateral organizations like the ones present in this panel. But not only uh, quantity, but also quality. Uh, not only the amount of resources, but also its efficiency. The impact and improving the efficiency of investment in infrastructure will allow to increase in 5% the uh, GDP of Costa Rica. And something similar as the average in Latin America. So these are 
very significant numbers. But what we are bringing to the table in this bank study, it's its impact as far as, as, far as equality. How much of this uh, growth it goes to the highest quintiles and how much of that growth favors the lower quintiles? And you can see in this graph, the yellow bar is the increase in income of the poorest quintile above 5% compared to the increase of income of the mo of the richest quintiles. In other words, investing in quality and quantity in infrastructure is a good policy for productivity, but also it's good from the uh, social equality point of view. And for this, IDB Group can and has been a strategic partner in uh, funding to the uh, public sector as well as funding the private sector through our bid and best uh, funding uh, PPPs. But one, uh, one thing that we think is core that support this is our technical assistance and genera knowledge generation. We think that this combo of interventions could be effective to ensure the quantity as well as the quality of that investment in infrastructure. Uh, in our uh, private uh, health, we have close to $20 billion in uh, infrastructure for transportation and energy and close to $26 billion in the public sector. Some of these examples we like to showcase here in Costa Rica's context is on the public side, we have the Cañas Liberty Highway, which was inaugurated a few years ago, which we hope to uh, extend to Caldera uh, through the Pacific uh, Highway and the Reventazón project, which is an effort that several here at the panel, uh, it's a public-private effort which just achieved last year the first award uh, between of a hydroelectric projects in the country. And all the knowledge generation, we believe, also contributes to this discussion, not only academic discussion, but also for public policies such as uh, in this event. Crecer, thank you very much. I hope I didn't uh, take that 245 uh, minute, uh, seconds and 165 times. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias. Y si puedo ahora pasar a Richard, que tiene una rica experiencia en la región con la, el área APPs. Y eh, me gustaría escuchar de su información acerca de APPs. Well, I'll speak in Spanish, and uh, above all, well, thank you for this invitation, and I thank you for your time. I just want to clarify, IFC is more known by its investment branch. I'm from the advisory unit. From the poor side of IFC, we don't lend money. We just help governments to structure transactions for that private capital to come and to make projects. So if you want funding, don't try to get a hold of me during coffee. I'll, uh, I'll give you contact data later today. I was asked to tell you about our experience. And this year we're uh, celebrating 30 years of this business in the world. So experience, we have more than uh, to speak in 10 minutes. But I do want to highlight a few of these. The question is, if everything is fine, how come the investors don't come? Let me share what we heard from them. What are they seeking? Well, they're looking for good projects. They're looking for good partners. They're looking for good processes. Good projects sounds almost logical. But we receive a number of requests, and the projects aren't as logical sometimes. The first question is, if the project responds to a clear need. Therefore, we are asked, for instance, we're going to build a 300-bed hospital when there's still no demand study to see if those 300 beds will be occupied or not after the inauguration. Or they come uh, to us and they say, we're going to develop a port, and the port has to be a hub. And all the ports and airports want to be hubs when the level of demand is not sufficient for this to happen. So the project, the realistic project, or the expectations of the government 
are proper, that's the first issue. A good partner, it's a partner, partner with which you can discuss uh, commercially when they come and propose the government has to be prepared uh, financially, uh, legally to uh, have a discussion with the private sector and be able to s close a transaction. And finally, the processes, the times have to be very well calibrated. So, uh, for instance, in the southern country, you have to present your bids in 60 days as far as the offer is out, and no one can do this. So we must consider uh, timelines to uh, to good due diligence and to have the corporate approvals to create any consortiums required and present uh, bids. And this is the first sign we launched the first day. And if you make a mistake in the term, you'll lose the partners right there at that moment. And finally, the uh, offers. No one likes to be uh, disqualified after spending one or two million dollars and uh, in presenting a proposal. And it turns out that the documentation that is requested is so extensive that a uh, formal error in a document and the proposal will, uh, will be disqualified. So we have to be careful in protecting the government requesting necessary documentation, but let's not be so excessive that you can cause error in these tenders. Uh, supervision is not uh, something minor. Many times governments are focused in the uh, tender and once a, a winner is awarded and the cameras come, when the dance is just starting and it's 20 or 30 years of implementation. So supervision is something that must be planned from the onset and not uh, how it's happened in the past where the structuring process and we're going to the promotion my team comes and says the government team has a supervision contract supervision team and the first contract is out is a hundred million dollars that has have to be supervised for 20 years and the government is not prepared to do that so before this scenario what to do the truth is after the finance uh, minister spoke in the last session i was about to leave because she said everything i was going to say so now i have to and uh, tell them more and give you further details. But she mentioned the legal framework and she also mentioned the government's commitment. And I would like to start uh, with the government commitment. I think it's a very important topic. I think these projects are not just a few months long. To give you an idea, our global average of 30 years of doing this to structure a transaction from the moment the government signs a mandate for advice to the moment we close that tender is approximately two years so it's two years in which the government's come in and has to be constant for this project to advance in each one of the phases in each issue identified during the inf uh, structuring and studies has to be solved before the uh, tender uh, moment and this regards not only creating a law or an institution but also a uh, perform proactive uh, monitoring of the government agencies that want this project to uh, be carried out. And this is a process. I remember I started this business in the 90s in privatizations in my country in Peru, and the practice of uh, ministers was to meet every month, uh, every Monday at 8 p.m. in the uh, commission president's office, Ministry of Environment and Mining, to discuss all the projects. This for me was political commitment. Every time focus and an international investment uh, investor would come, he had a red carpet, he would meet with the president, with the minister, and this commitment has to be constant. It's not about finding a victim to give the responsibility to carry out the PPP program and good luck see you in, uh, at the moment of the tender, this is a constant monitoring. Obviously, uh, we uh, do, do, do have a framework, a law, and a suggestion here. Don't make very detailed laws. We are constantly all learning. If you make a very detailed law that goes to the level of what clauses the contract should have, believe me, you'll have to modify that law because 
we're constantly learning. If you could establish a good framework law, complete, and then manage details and regulations into the supreme orders or minister orders, that would give greater flexibility. What should the law include? Well, one of the most important topics in the implementation of projects is the roles that each government unit has in the project cycle. So you'll have the minimum there, the ministry of the corresponding sector, the ministry of finance, you'll have the uh, PPP unit if there is such created or not, you have the comptroller, and in some cases you'll have the Congress. The sector regulator has also an important role, so we're talking about five or six parties which would normally would have to interact. If these roles are not clear in the law, what you'll have during the implementation is a nightmare because everyone will want to give opinions on topics that are not of their area, and then the structuring process would extend. So try to give the greatest clarity to the law as possible. The second issue that could arise is for the project to become the hot potato go from one hand to the other, assuming that the next one will review and at the end nobody reviews and then the tender stage comes and there's a little monster where you have to find an investor for. So roles have to be very clear between all agents. The third thing is a project cycle, how to identify projects and this is not only in PPPs. PPP is only an instrument once you have found a project that makes sense from the economic standpoint and the society needs. So first, the project has to be identified, has to be prioritized, cost-benefit made, and then determine if it should be a PPP or public works. And then how it's structured and how the tender is, who will perform the uh, contingent risk assessment, which uh, usually is the Ministry of Finance. And finally, and very important, who will supervise the execution of the project and which will be the resources associated. And the fourth uh, topic is to create a PPP unit, yes or no. And this will depend very much on the project portfolio, on the amount of projects that exist in the different sectors involved. But at the end, what you need is to have a specialized group in PPPs. You'll face investors, they'll so come with their attorneys, finance experts, engineers, very powerful teams, very experimented teams in these type of processes, and you have to generate a strong counterpart. It has to be uh, an equal level discussion. So the team has to be well-developed, well-trained, well-paid, I would add, because one of the big challenges is that in public administration, you train officers and you don't pay them well, and three months later they leave and you have to retrain new ones. So the government team has to be as strong to be able to discuss with investors. And it must have resources. We're not saying that the government team has to be an expert in financial modeling, an expert of the legal expert. What I'm saying, they have to be experts in managing the experts who will be able that they'll uh, subcontract, they can hire a financial expert, legal expert, environmental experts. Right now we're using more experts in communications because all projects of are high profile, therefore everyone has an opinion on the project, so we have to position this in the public opinion. And for this we need resources. And these resources can come from banking, can come from uh, donors, from the budget. Next important topic, and I mentioned this, is the project. My colleagues uh, uh, spoke about the pre-feasibility, but I would add if these pre-feasibility studies could be preferably done with independent advisors to give greater credibility when you go and uh, promote, uh, you could say that these studies have been done with uh, very well-known firms, and this lowers the risk uh, perception of the investors risk distribution has to be balanced. What we want is for the private sector to contribute to achieving uh, public goals, but without this being a business. And we have to be very clear. You go out to promote something, you have to promote a business. The business has to make sense. 
has to be bankable, has to be able to attract fu funding and timelines once again. So far, we haven't found a magic wand for an infrastructure project which requires time in its technical, financial studies, legal, environmental studies to be performed in a shorter time. So there has to be time for active promotion and different uh, from public works. It's not just an advertisement in the newspaper saying I'm going to build a road. The government will assume all risks. Therefore, you will receive 15, 20 constructors. Once you tell those 15 or 20 constructors, now you will assume a number of risks for construction, operation, funding. How many do you think will be left? This is a competitive market where you have to go and promote the projects proactively. Someone said in the previous session, all countries are doing the same thing. When you go out and promote, you'll find in the, in the morning session, Brazil was offering, and in the afternoon, Mexico will be offering the same sponsor. The universe of investors is not uh, infinite, infinite. We're all behind the same uh, sponsor's money. So we have to be proactive, and that was my last topic for me. Uh, governments that get into this must understand clearly which is the uh, objective investors market and who are the funders. Remember that uh, one in these type of transactions, 70, 80 percent of the uh, of the funds will come from investors, not in capital providers. So if you remember to include in the contracts the need of the investors, the project won't be bankable. So a typical problem of mismatch of a currency. So on one hand, we have a contract which is in local currency with adjustments uh, for ex inflation, and then you have to go and raise debt in foreign currency. So who will assume that exchange uh, difference? Uh, someone might say, well, the hedging market, it, it, it could stand eight years maximum in our countries, and it has the risk of a currency mismatch in the coming years. And the last topic is we have to foresee what type of funding will come to adapt contracts. A typical issue in Colombia, when there was the fourth generation of roads, it established that 50% of payments they would come from tolls and the other 50% would come from payments for availability. And it was foreseen that the local market in pesos wouldn't be enough to mobilize funding for the whole program. So it was established that part of the payments for our availability would be in dollars. This way, uh, this would facilitate all types of funding, either commercial, foreign currency, or capitals market. Although fine funding responsibility would be from the private sector, you must foresee in your transaction structure, in your financial modeling, how these parts will come in and generate mechanisms in contracts for a future award to be able to raise the money. I think I exceeded my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, from Richard's talk, we can see why IFC now has more folks doing advisory work than they have actually working on projects, because there's a lot of wisdom there that I think we can all learn from. So uh, now it's uh, my opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, de-risking of projects. Uh, uh, as you would have heard, I work for MEGA, and at MEGA we are involved in promoting foreign direct investment into developing countries for the twin goals of the World Bank group, ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. Foreign direct investment can be a very powerful catalyzer for creating markets and for creating value chains across uh, economies and also for transferring technology. So the focus of MEGA since its birth 30 years ago has been around catalyzing foreign direct investment. So as I mentioned, uh, for 30 years, and we have been supporting projects in 111 countries, 850 projects all told. And our projects have uh, been uh, 
also uh, very well represented in the Latin American region and also across many sectors, especially in infrastructure, so in uh, climate uh, infrastructure, in uh, telecoms, transport, power has been a particular strong focus, especially recently. Uh, and so we have a strong track record of uh, mobilizing private finance into foreign direct inv investment space by de-risking projects. And we've had a period of strong growth, especially recently, where we've had uh, growth in our portfolio of around $12 billion since 2013, such that our portfolio now ourselves on innovating. Uh, we offer a political product and we offer a credit enhancement product. And those products are particularly valuable to foreign investors looking into emerging markets in developing countries because when you ask foreign investors what their main concern is in coming into new markets, it is uh, concerns around political risk. So to the extent that MEGA, and there are of course others in this space as well, uh, IADB, IFC, and the bank also has guarantee instruments, MEGA's particular focus is in the political risk and guarantee space. Um, these products can uh, be very helpful, especially first investors to come in, first investors into particular sectors in countries where there have been few investors coming in from overseas to invest in the past. And uh, two particular uh, examples of how we've innovated with our products has been in, in through introducing what uh, we call a non-honoring of financial obligations product, which is a kind of credit enhancement. And it was through this product that we were involved in helping uh, Citibank come in and support the development of mass transit in Panama City, which was facing a major congestion problem. And through our non-honoring uh, product, we were able to mobilize around $250 million of financing for that project to support the very first um, metro lines in the city. Another uh, example I'd like to share with you is uh, with uh, our support of Turkey's first green and social project bond. Uh, and MIGA in this space collaborated with EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And there, uh, the EBRD offered a, a liquidity-backed uh, instrument, and MIGA offered political risk insurance. And through that, we supported a greenfield project bond for a hospital project, which was structured through a PPP. And the PPP framework was also supported by advisory work from uh, the bank and IFC. So this particular structure is very interesting because at the time that uh, we were involved in structuring this pro project, uh, the uh, uh, Turkey had fallen uh, below investment grade, and the view was that through this structuring, we could sort of pierce the sovereign ceiling and get a structure that was would deliver an investment grade rating. Through, so through EBRD's liquidity facility and through MIGA's political risk insurance, we were able to get a two-notch project upgrade from the sovereign rating, which I'm sure many of you know is quite unusual. Uh, since that time, uh, Turkey has been further downgraded, unfortunately, and so now the structure is still in place, and now uh, we have a four-notch upgrade from the sovereign's rating in the market. So uh, this doesn't happen uh, very often, and I think it points to a number of factors. One is uh, the use of these tools that exist out, in, out there in the market, but when combined can deliver a very powerful uh, force for mobilizing private finance into a sector like hospitals, which is somewhat unusual, and also able to pierce the sovereign ceiling, which is also uh, pretty unusual as well. 
Now, uh, this actually hasn't yet been replicated elsewhere. And when we look at what we think could make this type of project structure replicable elsewhere, we think that, uh, first of all, it's probably most impactful for countries that are rated only slightly below an investment grade. We think that a strong track record on delivering on PPPs is probably quite uh, helpful to have in place, and Turkey has had a history of successful PPPs. I hope that continues. And uh, also a track record on a relatively strong regulatory framework. So we think that those three factors would be quite, uh, would be helpful in terms of the context of trying to use this structure in other locations. It does point to the strength of partnerships. Uh, clearly, I think if, as we've seen from speakers on this panel and previous speakers, mobilizing as we did with EBRD in Turkey, can make a big difference. And I think even at the World Bank Group, working across the bank, that is IDA and IBRD and IFC and MEGA, combined, we can do a lot more. To, and part of what we are trying to somewhat uh, re-engineer the World Bank Group about is mobilizing more finance to bring in the private sector. Because we recognize, as I think we've heard others say, that working alone, the public sector, the multilateral community, cannot solve the infrastructure gap. And working together, we have a better chance of making that uh, dream come to fruition. And when we look at what we're doing across the World Bank Group, we are trying to see how groups uh, like Richard's, the advisory teams, can come in and work closely with governments, also the bank's advisory teams, and create the frameworks that are likely to bring in actual operations on the, uh, supporting the private sector through IFC or MEGA. And this then can create a chain of events that is more likely to lead to mobilizing private finance. So this model, what we call the cascade, or mobilizing private finance for development, is a new way of working across the World Bank Group that we hope can help uh, find and catalyze more private sector finance so that this infrastructure gap can at, at least uh, uh, be less than we see that it is today. So I think with that, I will uh, uh, end my portion of the discussion. And I think we have maybe a few more minutes. So perhaps I'll just go a little off script, actually, and <laughs> ask uh, my colleagues. We've heard uh, quite a lot from, uh, from the panelists here and from other panelists. Perhaps I could just throw out to you, um, I think the, the minister said earlier today that uh, there's a lack of bankable projects. And I think at MEGA, when we discuss among ourselves, we hear about the lack of bankable projects. So if you could do one thing to create more bankable projects in this region, what would that be? So I'll just open it up to anyone who'd like to perhaps answer that question. Maybe I will give a bit of perspective from more of a macro view. Um, I think it would be inconsistent to think that there would be a lack of bankable projects given the evidence that I presented. So there may be, must be a coordination failure in a sense that uh, there are a lot of projects, but the right projects don't come up um, and they're not uh, put forward to either the uh, international banks or the government is not aware of it and generally it's well understood in the literature that this is a big bottleneck for growth in many countries particularly countries that are starved for 
uh, infrastructure investment. And it has to be investments in a very scarce environment in fiscally constrained countries uh, or in countries with high risk premiums because of political risk. These projects need to be put into areas that will create spillover effects. In a sense, it would be a cluster of uh, industries or uh, firms that will be benefiting from that. And because there is not one clear private investor that wants to push that project, but a number of them, there is an opportunity for governments to think also of how they can link up with uh, business uh, councils and get a sense of what could create these economies of scale that will then lead to growth enhancing and job creating effects. And I think this is a challenge. I think there are, there are opportunities for innovations in that area. Planning body with a detailed plan and pre-investment studies that are fairly advanced and an entity that can be in charge of the PPP in charge of the technical, financial, legal structuring of projects in such a way that they're mature for the market. Unfortunately, most countries uh, doesn't have this ideal world. So let me give you an answer from my own experience. I believe that when the IDB funded the transportation infrastructure project on the first stage, we got there, there were no projects and two or three years went by and we couldn't start the RFPs because we didn't have any projects. We learned a series of lessons in the first stages of these projects and we incorporated within the operation feasibility studies and even at the design level. What has happened in the second stages of uh, the transportation structure and road uh, we've gone in just eight months from approval to bid design and the designs are ready bids are being looked at and this gave us great maturity in the case of transportation infrastructure the strategy of the government has been we're going to invest on the first stages in drafting studies and final designs in such a way that on the second stage we can bid as public works and then as a part of a con concession and these are shortcuts i believe these are uh, these are not this is not a solution for all countries and circumstances but when we have huge institutional weaknesses and a scarcity of resources uh, planning and to draft projects it can be a short shortcut that can dynamize investment in infrastructure. You said one thing and I it's very difficult to just say one thing. I think the point of departure is to have a solid project from an economic standpoint. There is no way we can convert a poor project into a good project through a financial structure. The project has to be good from the on start. Secondly, in the funding structure in the PPP, this may sound against innovation, but you don't have to invest many things here. I think investors will acknowledge, will recognize a good contract when they see it, as we recognize a poor contract when we see it very quickly. What do I mean by this? For instance, don't try to um, uh, come up with a force majeure clause. In the international world, they're overcome. Take advantage of everything that worked and try to replicate them. The termination clause people get very creative oftentimes an investor comes that has to raise 500 million dollars and have has to explain bankers how the termination clause works and i think what you need to have is it's good to bring innovation but it's also good to observe everything you've learned and worked and what can be replicated and put that in the contracts remember that 
there is a dialogue afterwards, which is a struggle between the ones supplying the capital and the debt. And we should try to facilitate this dialogue with contracts that already incorporate project finance mechanisms. Well, thank you very much all for those great insights. And if I could ask you to give a round of applause for our panelists. I learned quite a bit, I hope you did too, and I, I think we're headed to lunch. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that, as I'm sure you will, and I, I hope you'll take the opportunity to speak to the panelists uh, here and who you've seen earlier in the morning. Thank you very much.